I think we're going to get started. The music kind of turned down, so I think that's my cue. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about augmenting human decision making with data science. So my name's Kelsey Peterson. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, my Twitter handle is Kelsey underscore Peterson. But I actually have a confession to make. I rarely use Twitter. I think I signed up for it like eight years ago. But I'm trying to get back into it. So feel free to tweet at me or share this presentation. Um, I'd love to get in contact with you all. So I'm a software engineer at Stitch Fix, a personalized styling service for both men and women. And just out of curiosity, how many of you here today have heard of Stitch Fix? Whoa, OK, that's awesome. Um, and how many of you guys have used Stitch Fix yourself? OK, sweet. So for those of you who haven't used Stitch Fix, the way that it works, um, if you're looking to sign up, is you go to stitchfix.com, you fill out your style profile, where you answer questions about your size, about your fit, about your style, and your price preferences. And so then you, the client, are matched with a personalized stylist. That stylist then works within our internal software. Um, and they see information about the client. And they're also served a potential inventory for them to pick out about the clients. And I specifically, I stated that I was a software engineer at Stitch Fix. And I work specifically on the styling engineering team. So I work on the team that builds and maintains the software that stylists use. And so when stylists are making decisions about the inventory, we have algorithms to help guide those decisions. So then the stylist is in charge of hand selecting five items for each client. That box of items is then shipped directly to your door. You're able to try on these items in the comfort of your own home. You keep what you want, and you're able to return the rest. So over the course of this talk, while we're talking about augmenting decisions, I'm breaking it down into three sections. So first, we're going to be talking about the ways in which humans make decisions. Second, we're going to be talking about the limits of human decision making. And third, we're going to be talking about the ways in which we can help users make decisions within our software. So the first question, how do humans make decisions? The prominent psychological theory on human decision making is called the dual process theory. This was popularized by Daniel Kahneman's book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which came out in 2011 and has been on top of the charts ever since. Uh, the dual process theory breaks down human decision making into a two system approach. So system one is like the hair shown in this photo. It's quick, it's automatic, whereas system two is like the tortoise. It's more slow and effortful. So first, system one. System one is what fuels our impressions and our feelings. It's fast, automatic, and intuitive. It's driven by associative memory. And it's constantly creating this impression of what's going on around us. So let's take this example. You can see this man up on the screen, and you automatically assess his mood as happy, or this woman's mood as sad, or this dog with its ball in its face that looks really excited, probably playing catch with its owner. And so we didn't actually intend to assess the mood of these images, but it just happened. And that's what system one is. It's effortly, effortlessly jumping to conclusions, judgments, and decisions. And what I found really surprising when working on this talk is finding out that 95% of human decisions are made in this way. They're made instantaneously within system one. And so system one is really automatically generating these intuitive uh, reactions and instantaneous de decisions that govern the majority of our lives. So in contrast, system two is a more effortful, deliberate type of thinking. It's used for complex math problems, exercising self-control, or performing a physically demanding task. So similar to what we did in system one, let's try out an exercise to get us more comfortable with what system two feels like. So you can see this multiplication problem up on, up on the board. You know that you could probably solve it with a pen and paper. You also probably know that the answer is not, as, not zero, because it's not being multiplied by zero, and that an answer of 10 million would also be uh, somewhat implausible. 
but the precise solution didn't automatically come to mind. And when looking or when interacting with system two, we also we often also sometimes feel a physical response. So maybe our heart starts to race, our pupils dilated, our stomach kind of tensed up a little bit because we weren't automatically able to come to a conclusion. And that's normal. And in system two, what we found in the example was carrying the computation was a strain. You needed to keep track of where you were and where you were planning on going. And perhaps you even gave up and pulled out your iPhone. But the immediate answer did not automatically come to mind. And so this is the framework that we're going to be using to think about human decision making. And what we've learned in this section so far is that uh, system one is what our gut feelings are. But it can be somewhat unreliable without training. And second is that computations um, can sometimes be limited with our own brains, and that we saw that we weren't automatically able to jump to that conclusion. And I think it's also important to note, too, that in talking about system one and versus system two, uh, this uh, has also been talked about in the context of left brain versus right brain. So left brain is more logical and analytical versus right brain is more driven by feeling and intuition. So now that we've understood, now that we all understand the ways in which we make decisions, let's dive into a few limits of decision making. And when thinking about the limits of decision making, I think it's important to frame this conversation as a partnership, an opportunity for data science to help. And so the first opportunity to augment decisions is that human decisions are unpredictable. And so decisions are highly dependent on environment and mood, especially within system one. Um, and our environment has substan substantial influence on our thoughts and feelings. And what studies have shown is that given the same set of information, we often make different judgments. So one example of this is with radiologists. So radiologists um, are in charge of examining x-rays and determining, determining if the x-ray looks normal or abnormal. And studies have shown that when radiologists are given the exact same x-ray twice, they contradict themselves 20% of the time. We've also seen this within uh, the legal system. So judges, um, studies have shown that if any of you are being sentenced for a crime, hopefully not, um, but if you're um, getting sentenced for a crime and interacting with a judge, you better hope that you're being sentenced right after lunch because judges have been shown to be more lenient after they've eaten some food and taken a break. And so the second way that we can think about human decision making in data science is that human decisions are driven by our own individual past experiences. And so since we make decisions based off of our own personal experiences, um, it can sometimes limit um, or augment the way that we make those decisions. We're also unable to store large data sets in our mind. So even storing um, one Google spreadsheet of data within our brains is impossible for most people, let alone an entire database of data. And this causes us to make decisions based off of this limited information. And then the third way is that human decisions are driven by our own personal views and preferences. And so since most decisions are made quickly and effortlessly and outside, outside of our own awareness, um, this means that even if we know we have biases within our decisions, they don't always go away. Uh, studies have shown that there's almost 200 known cognitive biases and distortions that cause us to think and act differently. One example of this is anchoring bias, which is the tendency to rely too heavily or anchor on past reference or one piece of information while making a decision. Another example of this is optimism bias. Um, as you can see, this guy looks pretty happy. He has a post-it that says, be happy on his forehead. Um, and he could potentially um, be, his decisions could be distorted um, by this optimism bias, which means that it causes a person to believe that they are at lesser risk of experiencing a negative event compared to others. And so what we've learned is that human judgments are often made with limited knowledge, are biased and inconsistent. 
which makes them prone to being risky and unreliable. So stylists are humans too. And so we can see this within our styling organization of what are ways um, that stylists are making these decisions and what are ways that uh, they can be error prone or risky. So first, um, inconsistent judgments. So when stylists see this exact same set of inventory twice, um, it's likely that they'll choose a different assortment every time. So we can see this first assortment, um, but it easily could be this assortment too. And we can't expect stylists to consistently make the same decision over time. We also see that stylists find it challenging to absorb a lot of information at once. And so stylists, since they're limited to the information that they know, when they open up a profile and are expected to style a client, it takes them a long time to gather context about the person that they're styling for. And this takes time and a lot of mental energy. Um, we also see that um, stylists only know the outcomes of the clients that they style. And so if we were purely relying on gut feeling um, and not relying on data science, um, there would be a whole, um, whole, uh, whole group of data that they would not be having access to to use to predict uh, the outcomes of the clients. And then we can also see that stylists can be biased by their own views and preferences. And while we train stylists to hopefully understand the client, these biases don't always go away. So thankfully, data science can help um, and can help potentially make these decisions less risky and more predictable over time. So in what ways can data science help augment human decisions? First, I think it's important to ground us about uh, what data science means. There's a lot of debate within the academic community um, about data science. What is it? How do we define it? And how does it differ from the data analytics um, and analysis that companies have been doing for decades? And so for the, for the purposes of this talk, I'm defining data science as the use of mathematics or statistics to answer a business question. And it differs from data analysis because it's not only about analytics. It's also about the collection, modeling, and training of large collections of data. So we can train, or we can guide decisions in two different ways, or we can use data science in two different ways. We can guide decisions with computations, and we can train decisions with feedback. We guide decisions by offloading part of the decision-making process to data science. Algorithms can help suggest items of clothing to our stylists. And second, we can train decisions with feedback either in the moment or after the fact. And before I dive in, I think it's important to note that at Stitch Fix, we use data science across all levels of our data, across all levels of our styling process. So we use data science to uh, suggest an indiv individual item of clothing, but we also use it all the way up to make important business decisions. So before the styling session even starts, uh, the stylists are matched with clients, and we do this intelligently. We predict the likelihood that the stylist will be able to satisfy the client that they're matched with. So first, data science can help guide the stylist in selecting each item of clothing. We do this in a few different ways. First is that uh, our data science team automatically filters inventory based off of client preferences. And so if a client says that they don't want to have jeans in their fix, we automatically filter that information out. And so stylists don't have to make that initial decision and be prone to that error. Uh, we also calculate a match score for each item of clothing compared to the client's preferences. And so the higher the score, the higher the likelihood the client will like the items that we send them. And you can see up here on the image that each item has a specific score, and that is calculated for every item and every client that we have in our system. We also um, regulate the number of items the stylist sees, so we only show um, the top percentage of items to our stylist. So instead of 
making them overwhelmed by choice, we uh, initially limit the items that they have to be making a decision about. And we use algorithms because they're better at predicting future events than humans. Algorithms are able to better identify and weigh predictors of success. But I think it's also important to note that stylists ultimately have all the power and final say. Just like the president, they have this veto power and can override any decision that the algorithms are recommending. So the second layer of data science assisting humans is helping guide the stylus in the expected outcome of all five items together. So what I mean by this is after the stylus has selected each item of clothing that is going to go into the fix, we calculate on the fly the likelihood that the client will like all of those items together. If it's above a certain threshold, awesome, nothing happens, um, it's green. But if all the items are below a threshold, uh, there's a warning sign that pops up, basically to double check that the stylist knows that they're making a more risky decision. And again, the stylists ultimately are the ones who are making the decision and can override our algorithms within our system. So then the third layer of this is that uh, client feedback uh, can help train the stylist over time. And so once the client receives all five items, they fill out feedback related to each item sent um, and then also feedback for the overall fix. So we can see this here. Um, this is an example from the feedback section of our application. This, the client fills out um, the scale of the size, style, quality, and fit. Um, and that information goes right back to our stylus. We also can see this uh, for the fix overall. They can provide the ratings and then provide any other feedback that they want. And so stylists have access to this feedback within our system. They can access it any time. And stylists are actually expected and paid for an hour a week to review their feedback. And we use this information to better train the stylists to make better decisions within the with or in the future. And then the fourth layer of this is that uh, we can train the stylist um, with feedback over all time or over a certain segment of time. And so all the information for performance is stored in the stats section of our app. And each performance can see the stats uh, related to uh, what I just mentioned with fit, with style, with price. Um, and if any of those metrics are too low, they have visibility into that and can alter their decision-making process. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to use feedback to hone our expert intuition. And Malcolm Gladwell made, um, made the 10,000 hours famous um, a while ago, but it basically talks about repetitive, prolonged practice to build our intuition, build our system one, build our automatic thoughts over time. And we do this with help um, from our styling leads. So each stylist within our organization has a manager, and the managers are in charge of helping train and coach our stylists over time. So the final layer of this is that we also have insight into the feedback for all 3,300 of our stylists across the styling organization. Uh, we use the performance metrics um, from this feedback to shape business decisions as well. So we do this in two specific ways. The first um, is that we use or we use this information to drive decisions about stylist training. So as I mentioned, we have 3,300 stylists around the country. Uh, we provide uh, training um, every few months to all of them. And if we see that the performance metrics of certain segments um, of feedback are dipping low for um, a large majority of our stylists, uh, we can help better train the organization as a whole. The second way we can use this feedback is we can use information uh, to drive decisions about inventory. And so if we're constantly getting feedback about the quality of our items or the size or the fit, that may not actually be related to the stylist decisions. It could be related to our merchandising team and we may need to reassess the inventory that we have.
So that brings us to, um, so now that we've talked about how algorithms can augment humans, I think it's worthwhile to also think about how humans can augment algorithms. And is that even possible? And what would that even look like today? So machines, while providing a lot of value in guiding and training our stylists, are also deeply flawed. They lack human experience. For example, um, if you want to uh, get a sweet shirt to go to a club in, uh, computers are really bad at uh, interpreting what that means and predicting things based off of that. Machines also are able to predict multiple options that the client will like, so specificity is sometimes an issue as well. It's also important to note that they lack any ethical standards. Um, this has come up in the news recently, um, actually, so I was reading this article the other day about how Facebook is hiring 10,000 people to work on security, which is mind-blowing to me. They, need sti they still need so many people to scour their ads to make sure that they're ethical, or to take, video or to take down videos of violence or suicide attempts. And they were just talking about this recently in light of the Russian investigation. And I think it really highlights the point that we still need humans to be able to um, assess whether something is ethical or not. There's also still room for improvement with modeling and training data. So uh, no training set of data is perfect. And with a constantly evolving business, our needs for our algorithms are gonna be changing. And so with that, we're going to constantly be need, needing humans um, to aid in this as well. And like I said before, stylists really are the ones who maintain this veto power within our system. They're given creative liberty to act on their intuition and gut feeling. And stylists are still able to override any computer recommendation. And so we see if a stylist is within our system and they're picking out items for our clients and there's a really low match score, um, but they really think that this item will satisfy the client. For example, up here, if they think this pair of green shorts is really what the client is looking for, they can add it to the fix and, or they can add it to the box of items and send it to them. They have the ability to do that. We also see this with overriding uh, the likelihood that the client will like all of the items in the box, um, they can override this as well. And so what happens is when the client overrides the algorithm and intuition doesn't match the algorithm, we can learn from that and we will continue to learn from that. And I think one of the best parts about the styling role and why humans are continually going to be important in this dynamic is that machines are able to find a wide variety of items that the client will like, but it's really the stylists who discover and select the specific, specific products that our customers will love. And that's why letting the stylists maintain power within our system is so important. And so at the beginning, I showed this image of the data science team influencing the stylists. But when this happens, when the stylists override our algorithms and work off of their intuition rather than the data science recommendations, the stylists are actually training the algorithm and they're creating this really cool feedback loop back to the data science. And so that brings us to what is the future of data science and what does that look like? So Hollywood likes to glamorize that we're all screwed by AI and that data science is going to take over the world and that we better well just forfeit now. Uh, but I don't think that's true. And so I think we, we tend to think about the left brain versus the right brain. But I don't think that's right. And we think about system one versus system two computations versus gut feelings. And I don't think that's the way we should be thinking about it either. And then we also like to think about Will Smith versus these robots, 
or humans versus computers. And I don't think that's right either. I think this is truly a partnership between data science and humans. And we, when we think about humans individually and data science individually, there's a limit to where that can get us. But I think the power is by creating this feedback loop between data science and humans. And in the beginning, I was talking about system one with humans and system two with computations and analytical thought. But I think we're in the process of creating the system three. And what system three is, is a combination of predictive algorithms and expert intuition. And this is why, um, and this is so valuable because the relationship is mutually beneficial. We're able to make decisions with more inform information and more predictably with more nuance and intuition. And so we're able to use this feedback from our algorithm algorithms over time through guiding and training to hone this expert intuition. We're also able to continually train our algorithms so when decisions are made outside of what we predict is likely to satisfy our client, our algorithm learns from them. And it's also important to note that poorly trained algorithms are just as bad as poorly trained stylists. We need this partnership to reach levels unreachable by just data or just humans. And so at the beginning, I showed this other image of system one and gut feelings and system two and computations. But I think system three is like what I was saying, this cycle of feedback between gut feelings and computations. And so the really cool thing about this at Stitch Fix is that we've seen a sizable business impact from this relationship. Here's a few key statistics that I think are worth noting today. Um, first is lower labor costs. So as we, aug as we offload part of the stylist job onto data science, we see that the time that it takes for the stylist to really understand and select those best items for the client decreases. We've also seen an increased keep rate over time. What I mean by that is that, that our clients keep a higher percentage of items that we send them, so they're more satisfied with the items that they're receiving from us. We also see fewer mistakes from humans, and so by providing guiding, guidance and training throughout our software, we limit the opportunity for stylists to be making these more risky and unpredictable decisions. And finally, we've seen greater client satisfaction. And this is really important for any company. We always want our clients to be happy. And so we talked about a lot today. We talked about how humans make 95% of their decisions with system one. We also talked about how human decision-making is limited by information, biases, and inconsistency, which can lead to less risks and uncertainty. We also learned that data science can help guide our decisions in the moment, but also train our decisions for the future. And that essentially partnership in data science, the partnership between data science and humans is essential because humans lack the ability to process large volumes of information, whereas machines lack empathy, intuition, nuance, and ethics. And both have limitations that can be alleviated with one another. And so this, I think, is the future of data science and humans. It's not algorithms versus humans. It's the partnership between data science and humans. Through this, we can hone human intuition and algorithms to become more reliable over time. And the sum will become stronger than each individual part. Thank you. I also have a shameless plug. So I work, as you all now know, for Stitch Fix. Uh, we are hiring. So if any of this piqued your interest or you're just interested in working with a really awesome group of people, 
uh, please find me after and I'd love to chat more. So I think that brings us to the Q&A section. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, so the question was, um, when there are issues with system one, like um, when you're voting against your best interests, are there ways for that to be alleviated with system three and kind of this feedback loop? Um, perhaps, I mean, I think it's interesting to think about system three outside of the context of just like technology and data science. Um, I don't know. Let me think about that. Can you come up after? Is that possible? Okay, cool. Yes. Uh, so the question was, how do we handle comments from our customers? Um, so are you asking how do we handle that? So your the question was, how do we handle free form feedback? Um, well, we handle it in a few different ways. Are you talking about in terms of like interpreting that or um, reacting to customers being unsatisfied. Okay, um, so first, um, I we do use some like processing to handle reform text fields. Um, we also, when, this, when the client is unsatisfied with items that we send them, we can, we have an algorithm that automatically escalates issues to our customer support team. Um, so then the customer support representative can take care of that. Um, and then also to uh, the, with Stitch Fix, one of the powers of having humans really power our system is that we develop these long-term relationships with our clients. And so if clients are unsatisfied with the items or like the total fix last time, they're um, highly encouraged to address that um, with the client. And one thing that I didn't note is that stylists also write a note to the client every time they ship a fix. And so within the note, this that's usually a really good opportunity to address any concerns or issues that arose in the past. Great question. Yep. Yeah. Um so the question was correct me if I'm wrong, but what's the balance between like creativity and the human touch versus like algorithms and like more stoic behavior. Um, I think ultimately like that's kind of the, the question of this interaction and this partnership. Um, I think it's something we're constantly looking at. Um, there's, like I showed in my slide, there's a lot of people are talking about fully moving to data science and what that would look like. Um, and I think the challenge is it's easy to be like, oh, we're moving fully to data science and we're only going to use hum humans. But really honing that balance is, um, I think, key. One thing that uh, we really focus on at Stitch Fix is putting our client first. And so thinking about, well, is this going to negatively impact the experience that they're having with us? Um, and if so, then um, we probably shouldn't be making that decision. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah, that, that balance is key in just making sure that 
our clients still feel understood and appreciated and feel like they're getting value from our service. Yeah, in the gray shirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your question was, uh, what, what goes into our algorithm? What data points go into our algorithm? Uh, so, um, I, I'm not completely sure I'm able to answer that question, um, but come up and talk to me after. <laughs> I, I don't know if my PR team would be happy about that. <laughs> So is your question like, how do you get over the hurdle of not having enough data to feed the algorithm? Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's a really challenging problem, I think, that faces data science as a whole. Like, how do you have enough data points um, to uh, accurately use your algorithm to predict the likelihood of certain things happening? Um, I think Stitch Fix is really interesting because we introduced recommendations and algorithms really soon after we started. And so the algorithms kind of grew organically as we grew as a company. Um, but in terms of like how to introduce algorithms once your company has gotten a little bit bigger, like maybe you don't have that data set um, already uh, available. I think, yeah, that's where humans probably play even a bigger part at the beginning where you're trying to get that data from humans um, and then ultimately move over to some sort of balance between data science and the human touch. Yeah. Yeah, so great question. So how do how does the how do human biases influence um, the algorithmic predictions? I mean I think this is also like another question of data science as a whole, like how do you have non-biased data sets? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I'm to be answered, to be quite frank, like I'm not completely sure, um, but, and I, I think that uh, the example of Facebook is a really good example too, where the data isn't necessarily unbiased or isn't always ethical that they're training it off of, um, but, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm not quite sure, but hopefully over time, if you can notice biases within the data, you can make, uh, you can train your model differently, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, so your question was, um, yep. Yeah, um, I'm sure we do. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess short answer, yes. Do I know like the technical details? Gotcha. So your question, your, I think your question is kind of tying into like, how does data science 
capture like the strength of predictive cues with an algorithm is like kind of a word that captures that and what attributes are more important to one person versus another. Um, and I think that's, that's where we can um, compare uh, different users' behaviors and we um, can draw the like success of one item that's similar to another client um, and use that data to predict um, for the client that's currently being styled and calculating the match score for. So I think that's, that's an example of being able to use the power of having millions of clients and millions of outcomes um, to be able to make those connections between the clients in our system. Yes, I think you're the final question. Um, currently, so the question was, um, for stylists who maybe like to override the algorithm a lot, um, and it tends to not be successful, like, is there any other kind of guard against that? Um, and in short, I don't think so, um, but maybe something we want to think about in the future. Great. Thank you.